When everybody made a Facebook in the sixth grade, we were all told, don't post anything online that you didn't want your grandmother to read. Were you guys told something like that before? That's what I was told. In 2015, I made a post that I was very sure I did not want my grandmother to read. So I went on Facebook before I made the post, and I blocked her. <laughs> Why she has a Facebook, I don't know. But she does, and she uses it. So I blocked her, and I told all of my friends who are friends with her not to tell her about my post. The reason for that is my grandmother is a conservative Catholic Korean immigrant. And my Facebook post was telling the world, my friends, my world, that I am transgender. You can see why I might be a little bit nervous. But I did want to tell her, I really did want her to know about me. And so I agonized for about a month trying to figure out how to tell her. I decided that writing her a letter would be the best way. There was a lot of balled up versions in the trash, um, and a lot of time that went into this. And it was a lot more complicated than I expected it to be, because remember I, I said she's a Korean immigrant. She does speak English, but there's a bit of a language barrier there. The word for a transgender is tudansu chenta. The word for gay, for example, is gay. <laughs> so translation wasn't really going to help me out. So I really had to break it down. In the letter, I explained what it meant to be transgender. I explained that I am transgender, and I gave some evidence as to why. And I ended with saying, I'm just me, just trying to be happy, and I just want you to know, and I, I hope that you can understand. And I love you dearly. On the day that I went to, tol to tell her, to read this letter to her, I brought my mom, um, and I was super, super nervous. I thought that this, was, this might be the last time I ever spoke to my grandmother. We were sure that this was going to be filled with resentment, with disappointment, maybe some yelling. Sat down at the table, my grandmother, my grandfather, and my mom next to me. And uh, I read them the letter. I ended with, I love you, Skylar. And my grandfather started clapping. <laughs> he said, so you're coming out of the closet. Then I was like, yeah? <laughs> so surprised that he even had the terminology to explain what I had just done. <laughs> I had struggled with the language to explain what I was doing. And my grandmother she looks at me and she says, I knew that. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? She says, I knew that. And I said, I mean, I didn't know that. How did you know that? And she said, okay. So now I have two grandsons from your mother. That's fine. I have a younger brother. And my mom and I are both in tears at this point. Uh, we're, we're so amazed at what we're hearing. Um, and she says, okay, so you can be a boy, you can be a man, you can be a husband. I'm like, whoa, whoa, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a brother, but, I'm thinking, okay, there's the but I was waiting for. But, in Korean culture, daughters take care of their parents. Your mother, has no more daughters. It is still your duty, Skylar, to take care of your parents. I said, okay, how many? I can do that. And that was actually such an important moment for me that I got those words, pumo hyodo, take care of your parents, tattooed underneath my mastectomy scar in my grandmother's handwriting. She does know about it. <laughs> as my sort of eternal vow to my or origins, to my parents, to my grandparents. Following this, I was super relieved. I thought that was the last person I was going to come out to. You know, come out on Facebook, it must be everybody, right? Um, turns out I was wrong. Because in the fall of 2015, I became the first transgender athlete to compete for any Division I men's college team. My story went viral as a result uh, in the news and in the media. And I made a very conscious decision to be open about my journey, to share myself. Because as a kid, I never saw people like me in the media, and more importantly, in athletics, and I wanted kids like me to see somebody like them in media, in athletics. Media led to talk shows, which led to me giving speeches at schools, universities, banks, for some reason, <laughs> conferences. And before every single speech, I asked my dad, he's sort of my media liaison, my speech consultant, and I asked him, 
Why? Why do they care about what I have to say? Sometimes it makes sense, right? I'm talking to a bunch of trans people or swimmers, and I'm trans and I'm a swimmer. But sometimes I'm talking to a random high school in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. What does the average 15-year-old kid sitting in math class care about what I have to say? Or I'm talking to a bank in Boston. I'm a psychology major. I know nothing about finance. What are they going to connect to? Or the most mind-boggling to me, uh, a conference in Indiana talking to a bunch of white evangelical Christian men. And I'm thinking to myself, there is nothing about me that overlaps with you. <laughs> but without fail, every single time, something connects. Somebody comes up afterwards and says to me, hey, I see you. I felt that. I've done that too. That helped me. Something, it, it just, it strikes me every single time our common humanity that we are able to find together. And I wonder why, how, how are we able to find that? And I think about it, it can't be my identity, right? Not everybody is trans. Most people aren't. Not everybody is a competitive athlete. Not everybody is mixed race, comes from the same background as me. What is it? What connects? And I realize that it's about challenge. More importantly, it's about overcoming challenge. Goals. Everybody has goals they're getting to. And if they don't have goals, they have goals to have goals. Part of our common humanity is about finding community in challenge. In high school, I learned a lot about facing challenges, specifically through some practice. I was on one of the best teams in the country in high school. We were the national champions at the time, and we were known for our grueling practices. They were super long and super hard, and the coach would write out the entire workout on the whiteboard, and we'd look at it and read it and do it. And sometimes we'd sit there and look at the workout and think, there's no way. We can't do that. That's absolutely ridiculous. That's too much, too hard, too long. We can't do that. Then he would say, all right, everybody, ready, go. And we would all push off the wall and do the set <laughs> every time. We just did it. I remember my first day at that, at that team, before I had kind of assimilated myself into this, into this practice mentality. And we'd already done two hours of racing, which is longer than any practice I'd done before then. And he wrote the last set on the board. It was 30 repeats of a 100-yard race. Maximum effort for another hour. Remember, we've already swum for two hours. And I'm looking at the set thinking, I've got to be misunderstanding the way he wrote that. There is no way I'm reading that right. But he reads it exactly as I thought it was. And before I can even catch my, my, my breath from the last two hours of work, he says, ready, go. And everybody pushes off the wall. And I think, oh my god. <laughs> and I go too. And we all do one of those repeats, one of those races. And I got done with the first one. I thought, myself, I thought to myself, thank God I got one done. You know, I didn't even think I could do one. Awesome. But before I can, even can be proud of myself, he says, ready, go, and we've got to do another one. Now we've done two of 30. And I'm thinking, there's no way I can finish this set. There's no way I can do this. But he just keeps saying, ready, go, and I just keep doing one more. Come on, I can just do one more, Skylar. One more, one more. And somewhere around 15, which is kind of a lot, but it's only halfway, I think, Oh my God, I can't even do one more. There's no way. So I tell myself, okay, get across the pool. You can do one length. So one length, one length becomes one repeat. And somewhere around, I don't know, 26, 27, a length feels impossible too. So I say, okay, one stroke. I can always take one more stroke, just one more stroke. And one more stroke and one more stroke became one repeat, one length. One length became one race, another race, and another race, and I finished the set. 31 hundreds. And I was so proud of myself. Everybody else is like, yeah, what's for dinner? You know, they're ready to go. And I'm like, oh, I just did three hours of racing. And that was how I finished every single practice in high school. That was how we became national champions. That's how we set national age group records. That's how I got recruited to swim in college. It was probably the most important thing that I ever learned in high school. And it's how I approach everything that is difficult in my life today. And what I realized is that success isn't about winning. Success is about continuously not giving up. This past year was also pretty difficult for me. I began the season with three torn ligaments in my shoulder. It's a pretty tough injury for a swimmer to have. The doctors all said, you probably should stop swimming 
we don't think that it's good for you. You should, you should stop and get surgery. My trainer was even hesitant to let me get into the pool to practice with my team. My coach said, Skylar, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to swim. I've worked too hard to get to where I am today. This is not going to stop me. I want to swim. And he said, okay, let's figure it out then. And it's not like we sat there and devised a plan for the entire season. We figured out how I could finish one practice, one set, one stroke. And one stroke at a time, it became February. February is championship season. It's where you show what you've got. And I was super excited to get up there on the blocks and race. My whole friend, all my family and my friends were there. I was going to have a little bit of a break afterwards, let my shoulder rest, which I was excited about. But I was also terrified. In warm-up, I felt awful. I felt heavy. I felt sluggish. I was missing every single one of my turns. I had this twisting, sick feeling in my gut that said, what if I fail? What if I get last? What if I don't even beat my old times from high school? What if I'm an embarrassment? What if I fail? What if I fail? And I caught myself. I can't control that. What I can control, what I do know, is I'm going to get up on that block. The starter is going to say, take your mark, boop, and I'm going to do a dive. When I enter the water, I'm going to do a pull out. When I hit the surface, I'm going to take a stroke. And I'm going to take another stroke and another until I get to the other side of the pool. I'm going to do that again and again and again until I finish my first race. So that's exactly what I did. One stroke at a time, I finished my first race. And one stroke at a time, I finished my second race and my third. And by the end of the meet, I had swum three best times, three personal records, and I was ecstatic. I had spent the whole season not even knowing if I could swim, much less compete, much less do best times, and I probably had the best meet of my life. And beyond that, people had had very low expectations of me as a trans person competing against other men, and I had not only competed against other men, I had beat other men. That was pretty cool. <laughs> when I started at Harvard, I told myself, you know what? Don't get last. Just don't get last. And not only in this meet did I not get last, but my best times put me in the top half of the entire Division I for all of the swimmers in my event. I was really excited, just based on my athletic performance. When the meet was over, I sat down at the edge of the pool, and I watched my team warm down. I had an ice pack on my shoulder because it was hurting. And I sat there watching my team. And one of the guys stopped uh, as, as he was warming down. And he said, hey, man, that was a really great meet. I'm really proud of you. That was an awesome race. And I was like, thank you so much. That's all. Like, thank you. I just, I was, I was beaming. I was so happy. I thought to myself, this is, this is my pool. This is my sport. This is my team. And I realized in that moment, sitting by the pool, that I was also crying. And it felt a lot like when I had cried at the unexpected acceptance of my grandmother. I wondered why. What was similar? Why was I crying? And I realized it wasn't because of this one moment, because of the best times, or because of that permission from my grandmother, you can be a man but it was every single thing that had brought me to that moment. It was every single time I had failed, every single time that I had not thought that I could get through a practice, but I tried anyways. It was every single time I decided to take one more stroke. But I'm sitting there, remember, by the pool, watching my team warm down, and I realize it's because of the team too. I'm here because of them too. I'm here because in the middle of the season, I failed miserably at one of our meets, and one of my teammates came up to me, and he said, Skylar, he picked me up. You are going to kill it at the end of the season. And you know what? After my race, at my final meet, he was the one, the first one who's there, giving me a huge hug, and he said, Skylar, you did it. I'm here because of him. I'm here because I can hear every single time I get up on the starting block, my dad's whistle saying, go, Skylar, at the beginning of every single race I race, whether or not he's there. I'm here because I hear my mom in the back of every single video of me swimming, 
saying, go, baby, go, go, baby, go, go, baby, go. Even though I cringe when I hear it, <laughs> it still fills me with love and support. So while I'm here because of my own decision to take one more stroke, always, I am also here because of every single person who ever chose to share their common humanity with me and give me strength. I am here because of every single person who has ever told me that they love me. So whether you're the person who's in the water taking one more stroke, or you're the person in the stands, the parent, the teacher, the coach, the ally, the grandmother, you have to take one more stroke. And you have to keep taking one more stroke and one more stroke and one more stroke until you're sitting on the edge of your pool, watching your team warm down, having just had the best meal of your life with tears in your eyes, thinking this, now this is the life that I want to live. Thank you.